Okay, so we're just going to wait here for a moment while everybody cycles in. Do we say continue? I got a, something up on my screen. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's program with the Westport Garden Club. I'm Jennifer Keller from the Westport Library. Um, if at any time you have any questions for Peter Del Tredici, Del Tredici sorry, um, please put them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we will ask them at the end. And now without further ado, Topsy Sidorov will make the introductions. Uh, welcome to Urban Nature, Human Nature, a talk by Dr. Peter Del Tredici. Is that correct? Tredici. Oh, Del Tredici is what I Tredici. Del Tredici. Co-partnered by the Westport <clears throat> Garden Club and the Westport Public Library. Special thanks to Jennifer Keller, the library's programming and events coordinator. Our speaker today, Dr. B Peter Del Tredici, is a botanist specializing in the growth and development of trees. He's been at Harvard since 1972, working at the Arnold Arboretum and the Harvard Forest. His widely acclaimed book, Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast, is a field guide to the flora of the future and explains how nature is adapting to climate change. Dr. Del Tredici's presentation will focus on plants that grow in cities without cultivation and their ability to flourish in spite of stressful environmental conditions and why this is all good. It is a pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Del Tredici. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, Topsy. I really appreciate it. And I'm just sorry that um, I'm not there in Westport in person. It would be, it's such a wonderful day. I don't know what, it's 50 degrees here today in Boston. So uh, it would be a wonderful day actually to be outside in Westport um, doing this, but uh, the COVID pandemic won't seem to, uh, doesn't wanna quit. So here we are back on Zoom. So without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, pull up my screen here and let me get my talk. Let's see, I, oh no, it's, it's this, this is the one I want, there we go. And uh, I'll go to the uh, presentation mode uh, and go backwards. There we go. So this is uh, going to be a um, what I would say an unusual talk for a uh, garden club um, in the sense that um, it's not going to be. I'm not going to you know be talking about how you can become better gardeners. I'm not going to be talking about plant propagation or some of those topics. It's really about, you know, um, how do we look at the world um, from the plant's perspective? Everybody is concerned about climate change and, you know, uh, what do we do about it? And it's always that discussion is from the perspective of the human perspective, which is totally appropriate. But I'm going to be talking about what's happening to the environment from the plant's perspective. Now, I used to teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design for uh, 25 years in the landscape architecture program. And I used to say to my students, you know, what's this class is, is not about, you know, what's happening right now in the world. It's what the world going to look like in 20 years. That's when you're going to be practicing. Your practice will be at its peak. And this is what you really need to think about, not the conditions that exist today, but what is the world going to look like in the future? And so that is really what this talk is all about is what's actually happening and what does it mean in terms of our future? So this first slide, um, I did not Photoshop it or anything like that. I took this picture in Detroit. And what this is really a picture of is you see those trees all around the perimeter of this uh, dump area. Those are Ilanthus trees, uh, Ilanthus altissima. If you've read the book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, that's the uh, what the book was named for. And of course, if you, uh, you know, I'm sure all of you uh, have seen the tree of heaven if you've been to New York and I'm sure even Westport has a lot of specimens of it, but it's famous for its ability to grow 
just about anywhere and survive uh, incredibly um, difficult conditions. And of course, that's why uh, it was the central metaphor for uh, the book, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Now, as Topsy mentioned, um, I published, this is the second edition of my book, Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast. It's a field guide. It's got over 1200 photographs in it. And it really is a field guide to the plants that are, you know, are the de facto native vegetation of the city. And what's interesting about it is you go through the list of the, uh, the plants and the, you know, the 200 plus plants that are in the book, basically. Um, about a third of them are native to North America. 45% to Europe or Central Asia, 13% to East Asia, eight are native to both Eurasia and North America and 1% to Africa. So if you, you know, think about this, that the vegetation, the ecology of our cities is, you know, truly cosmopolitan, just the way uh, the human population is. And, you know, I say this, I pulled this, um, you know, this is not a, um, this is not something that has happened overnight. Uh, there's not much data on how the, the vegetation has changed over the years, but there's a famous book called Asa Gray's Manual of Botany. He first published that in 1856. So that would be you know, 170 years ago. And at that time for the Northeastern United States, 10% of the vegetation, uh, these are not cultivated plants. These are plants that grow spontaneously was non-native. By 1890, the figure was up to 15%. And the last edition of the book came out in 1950, and uh, that figure was essentially double. It was 20%. And uh, the book hasn't been updated since then, but in the 1990s, um, state by state, the figure varied uh, for the Northeast from anywhere from 24 to 35%. So this trend of non-native vegetation establishing itself as part of our uh, flora has been going on really since the uh, pilgrims first arrived. And uh, it's not a new trend. It's not something that is, um, you know, just started happening. It's been going on for a very long time. And as I said, the, you know, the cosmopolitan nature of the plants that grow, not only in the countryside, but in our cities, it, it reflects the same sort of <clears throat> processes that we see in the human population that, you know, for the human population, this is the race and ethnicity for the city of Boston, how that's changed over the last 60 years. And you can see the, it, it responds to socioeconomic conditions. And depending, you know, the one ethnic or racial group displaces another, depending on those conditions. And at the ecological level, the same thing is happening, uh, except not driven by socioeconomic, but rather by changes in technology and environmental factors. So, you know, you think about, you know, when horses were the main mode of transportation in cities, uh, there was one type of vegetation that was sort of favored by that. But when the automobile uh, became dominant, that completely altered the whole structure and the ecology of the city and a, a different suite of plants uh, came in in response to that uh, shift in technology. So, you know, the, there's no, the, the ecology of our cities is very much uh, related to, you know, the diversity and the, the flux that we see in that human population. We're seeing the same thing in the uh, ecology of the city. And, when we talk about urbanization, I'm not just talking about, you know, sidewalk cracks and things like that. This is a, a map, you know, based on the, the density of the human population in the Northeast. And you can see that urbanization is a, you know, it's essentially a, a geological force that it has transformed, uh, you know, the entire coastline of the Northeast. So this is, uh, you know, urbanization defined as, you know, the density of the of the human population, 500 people per square mile. And uh, it's actually, this, this map is from the year 2000, so it's actually a little bit out of date. So urbanization is happening and it's happening at a, you know, on a vast scale in our area. And I don't know how many of you uh, may recognize what city this is. If, if you see that uh, river going through the trough there, this is the city of Los Angeles. and. You know, I like this picture because it illustrates from my perspective, you know, 
you can talk about what used to be native to the city of Los Angeles, but when you see that every square inch of it is covered with a road or a building, uh, the concept of an, anything being native to this environment that's been transformed by urbanization, it's crazy. Uh, you know, nothing is native to the city. Cities are, you know, a human creation. And, you know, to talk about native vegetation in urban context, that's a historical uh, discussion. It doesn't have anything to do with the current conditions because urbanization has transformed them and the plants that used to grow there are no longer adapted to uh, the conditions that now exist in the city of Los Angeles. Now, um, I don't know what, I'm missing something on this. Let's see, you know, let's see. This isn't quite uh, showing up clearly the way I want, but um, there's something called the urban heat island effect. And basically uh, what this shows is that if you look at the, along the horizontal axis, that would be the size, the population of, of a city from a thousand to a million and then on the vertical axis, that would be the difference in temperature between a rural area and a, uh, an urban area, more or less at the same latitude. And uh, what this shows is that in the urban area, particularly when you get up around a million, a city of a million or more people, the difference in temperature on a warm summer night between an urban and a rural area is roughly you know, between 10 and 12 degrees centigrade. That's about 20 degrees, 21 degrees Fahrenheit. So what this slide illustrates is that urban areas, because of this, this urban heat island effect, in other words, all the paving, all the buildings, they absorb heat during the day and then they radiate it out at night. That keeps cities much warmer than non-urban areas. So cities have actually warmed up uh, to the extent that is predicted for non-urban areas in the future. So if you're interested in climate change and you want to know what's going to happen, uh, you know, to, to the world in the future, cities are the perfect place to study this because cities have already warmed up uh, much more than the surrounding non-urban areas. So this is why urban ecology is really important. And we need to, you know, study urban ecology to begin to get a handle on what the uh, other parts of our country are going to look like uh, as time moves forward. And you can see this same, uh, you know, phenomenon. This is, of course, for the city of Boston. But, you know, on the left-hand side, that's the growing season length. As you get, you know, closer to downtown Boston, it gets much warmer. And on the right, it's essentially land surface temperature. And what's really interesting about this, these are two factors, the growing season length and land surface temperature, the plants are totally keyed into, you know, if you give plants, you know, a warmer, uh, you know, an earlier spring and a warmer fall, they are going to respond to that. These are the things that they respond to. So uh, it's one of my messages, you know, that the plants, you know, there are no deniers of climate change among the, in the plant kingdom. They all know exactly what's going on and they have already begun the process of adapting to it. And a lot of what we see in, you know, uh, the ecology uh, that's all around us, our, our adaptation to climate change has already happened. And you can see, uh, you know, things like growing season length and surface temperatures are uh, the factors that these plants are responding to. Now, this is a a chart of what we would call the minimum winter temperature. This is for the Arnold Arboretum in Boston where I used to work. I started working there in 1979. And when I started working there, we were solidly in zone six. Uh, the, you know, we got minus five degrees uh, Fahrenheit was our minimum temperature. And we've got down to that pretty much every year. But then, uh, you know, what's happened recently is a zone shift and we're now actually in zone seven, which is, you know, really remarkable. We can now grow, you know, crepe myrtle, Lagistromia indica in the Arnold Arboretum when we, you know, there was no way in the 1980s and 90s when, you know, uh, that we could have grown that plant. But, and, and all of you I'm sure have similar experiences in your own garden and everybody, Every gardener loves to push the zone limits. And this is, uh, you know, this is not something that is going to happen in the future. This is something that's already uh, happening. And, you know, that 1980 is a uh, 
pretty important year. That's the, the date that I like to point to. That's when I personally began to uh, become aware of when that the climate was really changing. You could actually see it in uh, not just the plant behavior, but you know when ice was forming on lakes and rivers and when ice was disappearing. And it's really been accelerating uh, since the 1980s. So, you know, what I like to tell people is within my lifetime, I can actually see, you know, real actual changes occurring in the environment as a result of climate change. Now, getting back to the subject of urbanization, which is what I really want to talk about today, is that, you know, uh, when it's urbanization, I, I like to analogize that to glaciation, you know, to the glaciers uh, come through, they wipe everything out and uh, the, the heavy equipment that is a uh, hallmark of urbanization, I call that the urban glacier. And what does it leave behind but uh, compacted glacial till? <laughs> you know, it's just like primary succession. Uh, it drives everything back to zero. And, you know, what do they do? They call the landscape contractor in. He puts two inches of topsoil on top of this and then uh, sows some grass seed and this whole process of rebuilding. Uh, you know, the landscape following glaciation starts. So, you know, that is really what urbanization is all about. It wipes everything out and then has to start all over again. And this is why the concept of, oh, well, it was, you know, there's a native vegetation to the city. Well, you know, when you look at this typical construction site, uh, the concept there is, you know, it's been wiped out, the native vegetation. Now there are patches of original vegetation that have uh, within the city that have escaped uh, the urban glacier, but those are, you know, uh, there are not too many of them and, you know, they're uh, sort of falling apart fast uh, in response to all of the various climate change issues. Now, uh, to bring this uh, idea home, uh, if you look at this map of Boston, the, the, the reddish color, um, that's the original topography of the city of Boston. The gray represents Areas of Boston were filled in between the landing of the Pilgrims and uh, 1880, basically. And then the, the blue represents uh, land that was filled in after 1880. So if you crunch the numbers, roughly 16%, uh, one sixth of Boston is uh, essentially built on fill soil, uh, totally a, um, you know, a human creation. And so, you know, I would raise the question of well, what is the native vegetation of filled soil? Of course, there is none. And, you know, the irony, of course, is that, um, you know, this is, uh, this shows, um, you know, this is the flood map that FEMA published in 2013 showing the, the, the flood risk map for the city of Boston. And everything inside that red line is fine and everything on the outside that red line is, you know, at risk for flooding. And you can see that, uh, you know, what sea level rise will do is essentially restore Boston to its original coastline. So, you know, people love to talk about restoration and stuff like that, but in some cases, uh, think about New York City as well as Boston, uh, restoration uh, would be a, you know, economic catastrophe. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, these are some of the issues that, that we're facing. And, uh, you know, the, the land that is uh, most at risk for at sea level rise is all land that was essentially artificially created by people for economic purposes. Now, uh, you're all our gardeners. And uh, as such, I know that you know that, you know, if you're gonna be a gardener, everything starts in the soil. And, you know, the more attention you pay to your soil, the better gardener you're gonna be. So uh, it's really important to understand this, this idea between these fill soils and native soils. They're very, very different. So native soils, they're layered, they're thin and porous, high organic matter content, low nutrient content, and high levels of biological activity. Fill soils, they don't have any uh, natural structure. They're heavy and compacted, low organic matter, high nutrient content, low levels of biological activities, and they're often chemically contaminated. So native soils, if you want to have a native ecosystem, you've got to have a native soil, okay? You can't build a native ecosystem on fill soil. That's a really important idea. And fill soils 
uh, they support plants, they can support an ecosystem, but it's called a novel ecosystem, okay? Fill soils, you cannot create a native ecosystem on fill soils. You, in order to have a native ecosystem, you have to have the whole system and that includes the soil, okay? Just not just a, a list of native plants that you put in the ground, that does not make a native ecosystem. Without native soil, you cannot build a native ecosystem. And just to you know, follow up on the soil uh, idea, you know, we we just you know just don't respect our soil nearly enough. And this is you know we're in the middle of winter now, and so you know the amount of road salt. I don't know how it is in Westport, but in Boston, you know, <laughs> if the if the very first snowflake they start spreading out the salt and. You know, nobody wants to compromise public safety for the sake of the few plants. And you know, what people are unaware of by and large is that what salt does is it completely alters soil conditions. It increases soil compaction. It decreases water availability, reduces cation exchange. That would be the ability of plants to pick up mineral nutrients and it elevates uh, the soil pH. So sodium is very similar to calcium. And so it has the same effect on soil pH, it elevates the soil pH. And what's really interesting is that, you know, again, as I said earlier, and I'm going to say it many times before the end of this talk, is the plants know what's going on. And those uh, species of plants that are adapted to the conditions that we've created, those are the ones that are going to flourish. So this mugwort, which is a European species, Artemisia vulgaris, it comes from areas uh, in Europe, where the soil is na has a is naturally high pH soil and the soils are very compacted and it's found its home, it's right at home here in our urban areas because it's found uh, those exact same conditions. And the ailanthus tree that I mentioned at the top of the, the lecture, which essentially lines our uh, interstate highway, it's the same thing. It's tolerant of compacted soil, uh, with a high pH, and that's why that has become the most abundant uh, roadside plant throughout the Northeast, because uh, we have created the conditions that uh, it prefers. Now, the other thing, of course, that is important to recognize is that, you know, the burning of fossil fuels um, puts uh, sulfur and nitrogen compounds up into the air, it's all fossil fuels, gas, oil, and coal, and then usually under the influence of rainfall, but some oftentimes without it as well, these nitrogen and sulfur uh, compounds rain back down into earth. And uh, this used to be called acid rain. You don't hear that much anymore, but it's still going on. And these compounds, when they come back to earth, they acidify the soil and increase its uh, nitrogen and sulfur content. And what's interesting is that the acid precipitation when it comes in contact with any sort of uh, masonry, any kind of cement-based structure, the acid causes the cement to dissolve and the calcium leaches out of the concrete and then creates a, a sort of a microclimate where there's a, there's a high pH, uh, usually at the base of any masonry structure. And again, plants like this chicory, uh, they like high pH soils. So it has found this little a perfect niche where it's got exactly what it needs at the base of this uh, sort of crumbling infrastructure that is this bridge uh, over the Charles River. So even though it's acid precipitation is coming out of the sky, the way it plays out in an urban area is it creates uh, high pH um, micro habitats that plants are able to exploit. And this is uh, probably the most important um, slide I'm going to show you. This is this Boston. Here's downtown Boston over here where my mouse is. But uh, this is a friend of mine who was a, a graduate student at Boston University. I let him put a, a, a collector. A, a, he was measuring how much nitrogen is actually coming out of it, falling out of the sky on an annual basis in the Boston area. And you can see the numbers are all over the map. But I want to call your attention to this one right here. 11, that's my house. I live in Watertown, Massachusetts. And what this means is 11 kilograms of nitrogen that per hectare. So that works out to be about 11 pounds per acre of nitrogen are falling out of the sky every year and have been probably for the last 
hundred years. This is a lot of nitrogen and it's completely alters the soil conditions. Now, most of our native plants are adapted to, you know, New England soils where there's very low amounts of nitrogen. You start putting this amount of nitrogen back into the soil on an annual basis, that changes the ecology and it changes what species of plant can then grow there. The good news is that you can actually uh, stop fertilizing your lawn because enough nitrogen is coming out of the sky on an annual basis uh, so that you don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, most of this um, nitrogen is comes from automobile exhaust. You can sort of fingerprint it. And the closer you are to a major highway, the higher uh, level of nitrogen you're going to have. And you see those four red uh, dots in the center. That's that, uh, you know, the Mass Pike and the Massachusetts Turnpike runs uh, not too far from them. So that explains why those are higher than uh, the other ones. And, you know, on a national basis, you can see, you know, nitrogen deposition. The Northeast is a hot spot for nitrogen deposition, uh, mainly from the coal burning uh, energy plants in the Midwest. This is the way the wind blows. And this is where we get the nitrogen deposition. So these are the kinds of things that are happening in our world. And, you know, we just sort of don't think about it because there's, you don't, you don't see anything, but I'm telling you the plants, this is the kind of stuff the plants know exactly what is going on. They respond to warmer temperatures. They respond to higher levels of nitrogen and they respond to higher levels of salt. So everything we're doing to the environment, uh, you know, it pretty much ends up in the soil and that's what uh, is driving sort of the ecological changes that we're seeing. Now, the other thing that is a characteristic of urban environments is they're fragmented. They're typically fragmented by, you know, roadways, basically. This is, uh, again, Los Angeles. This is the Arroyo Seco Parkway and that tunnel you, there you see on the left, that was the original highway that carried traffic into and out of Los Angeles, but after a few years, it wasn't nearly big enough, so they had to make that one way out of the city, and then they built a new highway that completely bisected the landscape uh, as for going into uh, the city of, of Los Angeles. And this is the thing about, you know, um, fragmentation. That's a, that's a polite word for urban sprawl. You can see on the left-hand side, you know, land development in Massachusetts from 1950 through 1999. And this is uh, not unique to Massachusetts. Connecticut is, uh, you know, also experiencing tremendous amounts of sprawl. But what the fragmentation does is that it splits up the habitat into smaller and smaller pieces and essentially uh, creates as a, a higher ratio of edge to interior. And you, you, that, that brings about uh, inevitably a, a great uh, decrease in diversity. So the fragmentation of the habitat is also something that has, has a profound impact on the urban environment. And, you know, one of the ways this plays out that I'm sure you're all aware of is that these edges, these disturbed, sunny roadway edges, if you want to study, you know, the distribution of invasive species across the landscape, the one factor that explains it better than any other single factor is what's the distance to the nearest roadway. And the closer you are to a road, the greater the number of, uh, you know, invasive species you'll find. I took this picture along the um, Sawmill River Parkway. <laughs> and I'm sure many of you have driven uh, along the Sawmill River Parkway and seen the porcelain berry that has just completely dominated both sides of the roadway there. So this is the thing about the edges. This is called the edge effect. This provides the opportunity for a lot of these invasive species to get established. And then from the edge, they move into the interior of the forest. And similar to roadways, uh, many of our cities are built along rivers. That was the original mode of transportation. And rivers are very much like uh, roadways in the sense that the water level is always changing. They're always experiencing some form of disturbance. In this case, it's a natural disturbance, uh, the ebb and flow of the, the, the water level. But as a result of that disturbance, uh, our river edges, just like our roadway edges, are dominated by uh, you know, spontaneous vegetation. Much of it is non-native. So it's this, you know, this flux that uh, 
our roadway edges and river edges experience that sets the table for a lot of non-native species. And of course, transportation corridors are another example of an, an edge. And uh, this is the, that's the Mass Pike and um, one of our train lines going into Boston. But what's interesting is that uh, that train line that I'm showing you also runs very close to the Arnold Arboretum. And so the last train on this line runs around midnight. And so after midnight, the train shuts down and that's when you know, all the animals come out. And these uh, transportation corridors, not the highway so much, but these train lines become avenues for wildlife to get into and out of the city. So, you know, a traditional ecologist would look at this and say, you know, these uh, train lines are barriers to the movement of wildlife, but in an urban context, uh, a, the barrier uh, actually can become a corridor as well. So it's the flip side of the barrier. Uh, you know, a lot of barriers are the barriers for some species and they are corridors for the others. So this is a very important ecological uh, phenomenon in the sense that it connects the city to uh, the suburban areas because once those trains stop running, uh, the wildlife can uh, do whatever they please uh, on those same tracks. Now, uh, if you sort of put all this together with what I've been talking about, and the European ecologists have done a, they've been studying this much longer than uh, North American ecologists, but uh, this is based on studies of 34 major European cities. They've determined that urbanization as a process that I've been talking about favors species that grow well in soils that are relatively fertile, dry, sunny, and alkaline. So there's your, that's a profile of, uh, you know, your typical urban plant. Now, this doesn't this describe every, about 60% of the urban vegetation fit this profile. The fertility, of course, that refers to the nitrogen deposition and the alkalinity refers to, you know, all of the, the, the cement, uh, the masonry that abounds, and of course, the application of road salt. So this is, so the urban environment is a very specific type of environment and certain plants are adapted to these conditions. And um, I use the word adapted, but what I really meant to say is they're pre-adapted to these conditions. In other words, they come from habitats in nature that resemble the habitats you find uh, in the urban area. So here's the, my friend, the Ailanthus. It's growing on the Great Wall of China. These are the dry limestone hills that surround the city of Beijing. And on the right, that's exactly the Ailanthus tree growing on the, the Great Wall opposite the Arnold Arboretum. So it's found the exact parallel niche to where it grows in nature. And that's part of the reason why Ailanthus does so well in cities is it comes from habitats that resemble uh, its native habitat. And of course, I took this picture in New London, Connecticut. And you know, from the plant's perspective, what is a you know, decaying brick building? It's, it's just a limestone cliff as far as this uh, Polonia tomentosa is concerned. That's the princess tree. And of course, uh, you know, vines, I'll, I have more to say about vines later on, but you know, the, the, the telephone poles are just, uh, you know, just stand-ins for trees as far as these vines are concerned, you know. So this is pre-adaptation. In other words, these vines are adapted to climb anything. And, uh, you know, the poles, telephone poles make a great stand-in for trees. And, uh, you know, if you begin to sort of put this idea of, of pre-adaptation, you know, to the test, where the plants that do best in the cities, what kind of habitats do they come from? Limestone adapted plants, are tolerant of de-icing salts and concrete rubble. Floodplain trees perform well on urban streets with compacted soil. So most of our best street trees, think about the American elm, the plane tree, the river birch, the pin oak, are flood, they're bottomland species. So, you know, species that come from the uplands, um, you know, hickories, the, uh, oh, beech trees, uh, maples, birches, they don't do so well as street trees. It's the bottomland species that are used to, you know, uh, dealing with very difficult uh, soil conditions, compacted soils, high temperatures. They're the ones that are pre-adapted to essentially growing on city streets. Woody vines, 
uh, will readily climb chain link fences and utility poles. Taprooted herbs from rocky outcrops go well on sidewalks. Disturbance adapted uh, trees that sprout back followed repeated weed whacking. So, that, you know, certain species of trees can tolerate having all their branches cut off and they sprout right back. Winter annuals that germinate in the fall and flower in the spring. You see these in your vegetable garden uh, most readily. Uh, they're well adapted to, uh, you know, then they're more robust, I should say, with warmer, shorter winters. So as climate change changes our, our seasonality, winter annuals are one of the groups of plants that are, they're the big winners. They're, they're not only, you know, they're just more robust and they produce a lot more seeds. And day length and sensitive species that leaf out early in the spring and hold their leaves late into the fall have an advantage when winters are warmer and shorter. Our native vegetation tends to be cued in more to day length. That's why, you know, the first week in October, at least there in the Boston area, that's when, you know, people go to New Hampshire to, to look at the foliage because you can count on that. Uh, but a lot of the invasive species are more opportunistic. They're more cued into temperature than they are to day length. And so if, if it stays warm through October, November, like it did this year, they just hold their leaves longer and get an extra month of, grow of growing uh, both in the fall and in the spring. So that's, you know, that's a huge advantage to those plants that respond more to temperature than to day length. And of course, warm temperate species from Southern latitudes uh, flourish in the heat island warmth of northern cities. So that's why we can start growing, uh, you know, crepe myrtle, you know, when we're before, there's no way we could do that. And nitrogen loving annuals uh, take advantage of uh, nitrogen deposition. So, you know, the take home message here is that the plants we're calling invasive, <laughs> Another way, another way you could look at this is they're just well adapted to what is actually happening in the world. Now I know this might upset a lot of people to hear this, because a lot of people think that you know invasive is like means you're intrinsically evil, and that's not necessarily the case. I'm not advocating planting these species or anything like that. I'm just talking about what's actually happening out there. Uh, in front of our very eyes. And as opposed to just saying, oh my God, this is terrible. We need to actually understand what it is these plants are responding to and why it is that you know invasive species are becoming so much more abundant than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so I have a very simple uh, way of classifying uh, urban landscapes when you, so you begin to begin to think about this problem. So there's the obviously the unmanaged natural urban landscapes. These are you know, essentially on private or public land dominated by a mix of native and non-native species. They're left over basically from another era. They haven't been urbanized, but they're constant, they're getting smaller and smaller over time. And um, you know, their soils may be you know, moderately, lightly or moderately disturbed. Uh, and they have to be maintained. If you just leave them alone, they'll pretty much be taken over by invasive species. So they do require some maintenance. Then there are the managed or functional urban landscapes. These are parks, gardens, Everybody, you know all about these. These are highly motivate, uh, modified uh, horticultural soils, high in nitrogen, high in organic matter. And uh, of course they have medium to high maintenance requirements. And then there are the ruderal or abandoned urban landscapes. These are post-industrial land, the land that no one takes care of. And these are dominated by spontaneous vegetation, uh, you know, and compacted or fill soils. And of course, they have uh, zero to low maintenance requirements, which means, of course, that, you know, because they don't require any maintenance, means they're highly sustainable. I will talk about that a little bit more. What I mean by sustainable, uh, but anyway, so, you know, as you begin to look around, you know, you can begin to look at, you know, how much of this ruderal land, this abandoned land does a city contain? And in that, uh, that figure is, is a reflection of the city's socioeconomic condition. So this is a map of Detroit. Uh, this is from 2009, uh, essentially, um, 40% of the, the land area of Detroit, and that includes both land and buildings, was vacant. 
And that's a, you know, catastrophe uh, from a sociological point of view because, you know, Detroit has lost close to 60% of its population since the 1960s, basically. So, you know, I'm not minimizing the plight of Detroit by, by any stretch of the imagination, but this is just, you know, uh, what I'm actually really interested in is what happens when urban infrastructure is abandoned and nature is allowed to take over. So uh, I think that's a fascinating subject uh, of study, but, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, people's lives and the, the economy. I mean, the, the, what drives the economy of these places is, you know, people live there when they have jobs. If there's no jobs, they end up leaving. So, you know, that's what Detroit needs is they need, you know, more work basically. So um, the, uh, let's look at a little bit about the, uh, you know, what Detroit, you know, what is this, uh, what is the vegetation telling us about Detroit? And because Detroit, you know, the abandonment process began in the 1960s really, and has been go ongoing since then, you have large stretches where forests have actually reclaimed large pieces of the landscape. and. It's a big issue. My design, my graduate school design students, uh, a lot of them worked on projects. Is you know, what do you do with all this vacant land? It's not like New York or Boston where the land is so valuable that you know it, it doesn't sit vacant for more than just a few years. Uh, in Detroit, uh, the land has lost its value, and the question is, what are we going to do to try and you know uh, bring back some value, either ecological or financial, to all this empty land. And you, you know, I took this picture about a mile from downtown Detroit, maybe one in 10 of the original houses is still standing. And, uh, you know, you, you felt, I felt like I was in the middle of the countryside. It was really quite remarkable to, to experience this. Um, you know, and clearly there's a wetland up on the second story of this abandoned factory. Otherwise, you know, there's a, there must be water on the floor there. Otherwise the willow wouldn't be growing there. And then, um, you know, this is what I mean by sort of a, a novel ecosystem. This is a, the, the drainage pipe in this uh, loading dock is clearly clogged and, you know, the water isn't draining out and there's the phragmitis. You can see how it's growing along the seam of the concrete there has taken over. And, um, you know, this is actually a wetland. There were, I was there in early spring and there were red winged blackbirds in there. And, you know, I don't know if there was any fish in there or not, but nevertheless, you know, in an urban context, this is a, uh, you know, a, uh, an urban wetland. That's a part of this whole like concept of a novel ecosystem. And, you know, the abandoned parking lots are an amazing place to see how vegetation takes over uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting process, this urban infrastructure. And when, you know, ecologists uh, in the early days of ecology, they studied succession, the change in plant communities over time, old field successions, how abandoned farmland in New England and, you know, New York and New Jersey grew up the forest after it was abandoned. And that was, you know, sort of the model for understanding vegetation change. And what we're seeing now in cities is what I call post-industrial succession, which is, uh, you know, how does vegetation take over urban infrastructure? And I took this picture in um, Rhode Island, the war with Rhode Island. It's not your typical parking lot because you see these pin oaks are coming in. So, you know, in a few years, this, this abandoned parking lot will be uh, nothing short of a pin oak forest. So this, the, this is actual succession. This is ecology is really happening. It just doesn't fit, you know, a lot of people's definition of what they think ecology should look like. And, you know, when you begin to sort of view the world from the plant's perspective, you know, and you begin to look for patterns in, in vegetation in urban areas, you realize that fence lines, the chain link fence lines, that's where inevitably you have trees growing uh, and, and what an ecologist, they call them safe sites for a seedling establishment because the uh, maintenance people can't actually get to these plants because they're enmeshed 
in the uh, chain link itself, the same chain link fence itself. So this is, you know, an American elm, and you just know the maintenance guys would love to get rid of this uh, tree. This is the bonsai American elm, but it's so it's enmeshed in the fence to such an extent that they they don't dare use a chainsaw to try and remove it. So this is what I mean by a safe site. And what's really interesting is that. You know, everybody talks, you know, rapturously about, you know, the, the um, hedgerows of England and all of, you know, they're, they're beneficial in terms of wildlife and so on and so forth. And in our urban areas, these chain link fence lines are actually the equivalent. These are urban hedgerows because the maintenance crews, they can't get to the plants that are growing right up next to that fence. So in this case, this is Fraxinus pennsylvanica, the green ash that is... Uh, taken over this uh, this chain link fence here. Now, the other thing about, you know, uh, urban ecology is a few examples. You know, whenever you have different forms of paving materials, they expand and contract at different rates in response to temperature. And you inevitably get a, a seam forming when you have different types of paving. So this is the trifecta of, of paving. You've got the concrete sidewalks, you've got the granite curb, and then you've got the blacktop street. And, you know, they're expanding and contracting at different rates. And, you know, this uh, green foxtail has found an opening uh, in that seam where the different paving materials come together. And this picture, that's one of my favorite pictures I've, I've taken, but I took the picture, but I didn't really know what was happening. I just knew there was something weird about it. And I, that's why I took the picture. But if you look closely, you see that the grass is only growing on the short end of the brick and there's no grass on the long end of the brick. And, one of the people who was in my audience when I was giving a version of this talk a while ago, he, he was a physicist and he said, well, if, you know, if, if, the, if you say those bricks are like metal, they expand in proportion to their length. And the longer they are, the more they expand and contract. And so the gap that forms uh, during this expansion and contraction process, it's bigger at the, at the short end of the brick than it is on the wide end of the brick. And, the bricks are acting like a filter and the seeds of this native tufted love grass, there's just the right size they fit in in that gap, but they, the other gap on the long end of the brick is not big enough so that no seeds are there. So, you know, I like to say, did you know, when I first showed this, I did some landscape architect plant this. I mean, it's so perfect. And this is actual true ecology happening here. This is plants responding to environmental conditions. And, you know, another example, this is um, carpet weed, it's malugo. You know, you turn your air conditioner on in June, you get the condensation. That's the beginning of the rainy season. This is a little plant from Mexico, an annual plant that you have, it grows in everybody's garden. Uh, it flourishes with the air conditioner drip. Then, you know, September 1st, you turn the air conditioner off. That's the beginning of the dry season. It's an annual plant. So it, it, it matures its seeds and then lays them down for the next year. And then the following June, when that air conditioner drip starts again, they germinate. So, you know, most people just <clears throat> don't pay any attention to what's actually happening. I try to understand it. So this is a... Uh, you know, just one of the things that, you know, in the old days when forests were converted to agricultural logging and then abandoned, they would revert back to, to, you know, a forest. But today, if the forest is converted into a city or a suburb and then it's abandoned, it doesn't go back to becoming a forest. What it becomes is a novel ecosystem. And that's what I'm going to talk about, sort of what this is, because this is what's happening to the world. We're not going back to native ecosystems. That that ship has sailed. And what is happening before our eyes is these novel ecosystems are emerging. And the thing about them is they're actually pretty functional and we need all the help we can get to survive the, you know, what's gonna be happening with climate change and the novel ecosystems, these are what are adapted to the conditions that are gonna be happening in the future. So, you know, the interacting forces of urbanization, globalization and climate warming, disrupt native ecosystems and promote the spread of opportunistic species, both native and non-native. Water, air, and ground pollution impacts soil chemistry, which impacts microbial activity, which impacts nutrient cycling, which impacts vegetation. So, you know, the vegetation is the icing on the cake. It's what happens in the soil that's really 
really important. And we need to understand that habitat fragmentation creates sunny edges dominated by fast growing disturbance adapted species. So as I said, you know, the good news is, is that the plants have already adapted to what is happening uh, in the world. That is really good news because we, uh, you know, we need all the help we can get. And this idea that, you know, only native species, we should only be planting native species because they're the best. They're not the ones that are best adapted to, the, to what's actually happening uh, to the world, particularly in our cities. And so these plants that are doing so well, uh, I like to call them the flora of the future because uh, there are gonna be more of those in, in the future, not less of them. So, um, you know, so if you've come with me this far, you might as well, let's just go all the way because I believe that a lot of these plants, not only are they not bad, they're actually really, they're good. They're doing beneficial things in the urban environment. Now, this is not to say that I'm advocating planting them. What I'm saying is these plants that are growing spontaneously, nobody is paying a penny to <laughs> propagate them or to plant them or to take care of them. They're just there. These plants are actually uh, helping make the city more livable, you know, not only for people, but actually for a whole host of, you know, wildlife as well. The birds really don't care that much whether, you know, a berry they're eating is native or not. They're just looking for a source of carbohydrates that's going to carry them through, you know, uh, the next leg of their migration. So, you know, carbon sequestration or oxygen production, organic matter production, nutrient cycling, biodiversity enhancement, uh, you know, provides food and animal uh, habitat for animals. The more flora you've got, the more fauna you have. Erosion control on slopes. These are just some of the benefits we get from this vegetation. Stream, lake, lake and riverbank stabilization, stormwater infiltration and water quality protection. Again, it doesn't matter whether it's native or not, water, stormwater passing through any piece of vegetated landscape is gonna be cleaner than stormwater that does not pass through uh, a vegetated piece of ground. Mitigation of soil pollution. A lot of the plants that grow in our cities are tolerant of, um, of soil pollution. And one of the, in fact, they, they, they sequester uh, particularly a lot of heavy metals in their body. They bind them up with uh, inorganic matter and they take them out of circulation. They don't detoxify the site, but they, essentially take these uh, elements out of circulation and are part of sort of the cleanup process. Temperature reduction versus shade. All trees produce shade and water transpiration. And of course, uh, there's an incredible opportunity for social, educational, and recreational contributions, particularly in areas uh, that, that lack, um, you know, public parks. So just a few of the plants uh, and tell you their stories and winding down now. Uh, the mulberry, you're all familiar with this. This is a remnant from the 1820s and 30s when the United States thought we could compete with China in the production of silk. And so there was a, a craze, not unlike tulipomania that took place in the Netherlands where everybody thought they could make a million dollars by you know, growing mulberry leaves to feed uh, silkworm moths and um, as far as I can tell, not a single bolt of silk was ever produced in the United States, but the, uh, the, the mulberry trees that were planted during that period are uh, a legacy of that failed effort. And of course, uh, in the era, this is uh, loading winter rye in Central Park. Can you imagine Central doing that in Central Park today? This is, you know, but in the horse and buggy era, the Parks Department was dependent on horses to do all their work. And they used a lot of those open areas to grow hay to feed their horses. So, you know, it's, uh, we forget how uh, things used to be. Um, and so the grasses that, you know, are, you know, everywhere in our cities, they're a remnant of this horse and buggy era. And my favorite little statistic is the very first urban planning conference that took place in the United States, 1864, was predicted that by 1950, many American cities would be buried under nine feet of horse manure. So that was the climate change issue of the day, as far as people were concerned. And 
there's really only one city in the United States for which this prediction has come true, I, I, I would say, and that, of course, would have to be our nation's capital. Um, you know, and kudzu, the vine that ate the South, everybody points to this as sort of the quintessential invasive species, but people have forgotten that 13 million of them were planted uh, during the 1930s to the 1950s, subsidized by the federal government for erosion control purposes. So it wasn't that this plant just spread on its own, it was actually planted and then it spread. So it's not just a biological issue we're talking about here, there's a sociological component as well. And if we don't acknowledge that, we're never gonna be able to actually do anything about it. So, you know, I like to say, if you can't become invasive after 13 million of you been planted, then you have a problem. The calorie pear tree that was like considered the perfect tree in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, uh, well now, particularly in the mid-Atlantic region, lo and behold, it starts showing up in the woodlands. And this is now, you know, a lot of uh, states have put it on their invasive species list and banned the sale. Uh, you know, of, the, of this plant within their borders. So it's kind of ironic that in a lot of places, you know, possession with intent to distribute uh, Callard Bradford pear is a bigger crime than the possession of uh, cannabis. Uh, Japanese knotweed, I'm sure you're all familiar with Japanese knotweed. Uh, you know, uh, it was the hot plant in the 1880s, and none other than the great William Robinson, who inspired Frederick Law Olmsted, loved this plant for covering up, you know, areas that were sort of messy and, and weren't cleaned up, and this would make them more interesting and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, he advocated planting this plant, and it was a hot plant, you know, right through the 1920s, if you can imagine that. But of course, this is what it looks like today. This is in the uh, New Jersey Meadowlands. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, in urban context, it doesn't bother me so much, but actually in a rural context, the, the Japanese knotweed is a serious problem. This is along the White River in Vermont. I took this picture in 2007. And in 2011, um, there was a hurricane passed through, Hurricane Irene wiped out all of the native uh, vegetation along the White River, but the uh, Japanese knotweed, it's got a root system that goes down four or five feet. It survived and it had no competition. And now it just dominates both uh, banks of the White River throughout you know, a large portion of uh, Southern Vermont. So this is, uh, or so I should say Central Vermont. So it's like, a, you know, a context matters. So, you know, a lot of these plants in urban context, okay, you can learn to live with them and they're not so bad, but in a rural context, they can become very serious issues. And so this the state of Vermont is really struggling with trying to control Japanese knotweed or you know, closer to home for uh, you guys. Um, this is, uh, you may recognize this is along the New Jersey Turnpike. And you're supposed to say, if this was a live uh, presentation, which exit? Uh, this is the Vince Lombardi exit. And you could look at that Phragmitis and you could say, oh my God, this is a plant that's, you know, non-native species that's, you know, ruining the environment. Or you could say that there's, you know, three or 400 landfills in this area that are leaking nitrogen and phosphorus and God knows what. And the Phragmitis is actually doing a good job of cleaning them up. Uh, by absorbing uh, these elements and it's doing it at no cost to the taxpayer. And so you end the argument, you know, well, we'd like to restore what used to be there in this salt marsh cord grass. That was what was there before the uh, Phragmitis uh, became so dominant. So, okay, let's just say for the moment that you do want to restore the New Jersey metal to what it was. The solution, I won't say it's easy, but it'll be very straightforward. And it means just remove the New Jersey turnpike because it used to be a tidal area and they built a turnpike there. That meant that it stopped getting the influence of tide. Uh, the marshland became brackish and the Phragmitis, it doesn't like um, tidal areas. It grows in brackish areas, low salt concentrations. So we changed the basic conditions and that change um, favored, I favored the, uh, the Phragmitis. So the Phragmitis is a symptom of environmental degradation. It is not the cause of the environmental degradation. And, you know, there are just so many examples where, you know, one of the most adaptable trees that I'm aware of, the black locust, there it is on uh, Riverside Park in uh, Manhattan, and there it is in 
uh, one of the missions in California, San Juan Batista. It's just an amazingly adaptable species. It's sort of, you know, America's gift of the world. You see it all over Europe and you see it all over Asia as well. And, you know, on the left, that's its native range. And you could look at that and say, oh my God, you know, so in Mass Massachusetts isn't part of it. So Massachusetts declared Robinia uh, an invasive species because it wasn't there when the pilgrim landed. But if you look at the map on the right, that's its actual distribution. So, you know, this idea of, oh, it's only, we can only find native species that we can go back in time to the way it was before the pilgrims landed. It's a crazy idea. There's, we can't set the clock back, you know? And uh, it's really, uh, you know, we have to live with the world that we've created. And when you plant plants and they begin to spread on their own, that's called assisted migration. And we do that for both native and non-native species. So when a native plant like this seaside goldenrod on its own, under the influence of all the road salt spread along the, the interstate highways, began spreading 60 miles. It now goes to Sturbridge, Massachusetts, in response to all the salt. It used to be confined just to the coastal area. So what do you call a native plant that begins to act like an invasive species? That's a little bit of a, a conundrum. Uh, and, and the word is that's been used by scientists is called neonative. So, you know, there's poison ivy making itself right at home. And there's the box elder, uh, that picture, uh, you know, it's from downtown Boston, but you know, you can go to Poland and you'll see exactly the same species. And of course the Canada goldenrod. So this um, invasiveness is really, it's about context and it's about the scale. It's this issue that it's about native versus non-native, that's, that just doesn't hold water from my perspective. You know, native is good, non-native is bad. No, that's not what is happening in the world today. Now, uh, future trends, I'll speed this up because I've gone on way too long. Generalists favored over specialists, bottom land over upland species, early succession over late succession. The shrub layer, as you all know, is becoming increasingly dominated by bird dispersed, non-native edge loving species that leaf out early. Vines uh, worldwide are becoming more abundant as a result of climate change and fragmentation, creating vinescapes, that's what you see along the Sawmill River Parkway, that move into forests and disturbed edges, smothering trees in the process. I consider vines parasites. They, they parasitize trees, the form of trees, because they don't invest anything in building a trunk. They just take over uh, the, the, the work that the trees did. So, and of course, pests and pathogens, both native and invasive, are becoming increasingly abundant and reshaping the composition of uh, present and future landscapes. Just think about the uh, emerald ash borer or, you know, gypsy moth or any of those. So, uh, you know, I hate the, my least favorite plant, bittersweet, uh, the kudzu of the north, as some people like to call it. And, you know, the, 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 the issue is with controlling invasive species is that it really can't be done without the use of herbicides, particularly um, woody plants. And, you know, there's just no two ways about it. We don't have the labor that, to, to do it manually, and it's not very effective. So manually, so herbicides really work, but a lot of people really don't like the fact that herbicides are being used uh, in, a, in the landscapes. And the other thing about herbicides is they kill all sorts of plants. It's very hard just to di direct it at the target species. And so uh, it oftentimes, you know, you, yes, you can kill the target species, but then you've got bare ground there and just say, I'm gonna come in and plant native species. Well. If you go in there and you know weed them and you know take care of them for a few years, you might get them established. But that's just gardening. That's not really ecology. So a lot of what is called restoration is actually just gardening at the landscape scale. So the whole issue of uh, invasive species, it's really you know put a lot of people in some very difficult position because you have to choose between sort of do I want to use the herbicides or do I want to just leave the uh, invasives alone. So. This is a very complicated issue. And so what I advocate is a process known as intaglio, a design by removal. Uh, you know, you don't have to, you know, wipe everything out. You can get rid of the things that you don't want and leave the things that you do want. And it's, it's like the difference between editing a manuscript versus writing a whole new script. So these novel ecosystems, is we have to learn how to live with them. And 
you know, what is it you would remove? Well, high climbing vines that strangle trees, um, diseased or seriously damaged uh, trees that represent a hazard, plants that are unfriendly or unhealthy to people, multiflora rose, Japanese barberry, ragweed, unsightly or aggressive plants perceived as uh, indicators of dereliction and neglect. So, you know, learning how to manage these novel ecosystems is, is where the key to the future lies. It's not just wiping them out and saying, oh, we're going to restore this to a native ecosystem. It's not possible, you know. This isn't to say that there aren't some uh, ecosystems that could be restored, particularly in uh, non-urban or rural areas, but in many of our urban areas, you cannot, restoration is not a viable option. So we need to learn how to manage them to increase their aesthetic or ec ecological functionality. And uh, this is what, you know, you mow the edges that, you know, so that it, it, it indicates somebody's taking care of it. You put benches in, uh, maybe a little bit of artwork to show that, you know, somebody's actually thinking about this site. And, uh, you know, I love this, uh, this quote from the first guidebook of Central Park, you know, before they could actually control dandelions, blessed dandelions in such beautiful profusion as we've never seen elsewhere, making lawns in places like green lakes, reflecting a heaven sown with stars. So my answer, what's wrong with dandelions? We need, we need to learn to live with them. This idea that, you know, we have to have a lawn without dandelions or we're doing something terrible. That's a, it's, this is a crazy idea. So, and sometimes you let nature do its thing, you get some amazing results. I like to call this, uh, as you say, Monet with weeds. And uh, this is my last slide. So I'm sure they're gonna put this on my tombstone, uh, adapt or die. That's really uh, where we're at in terms of climate change. Uh, going back to the way things used to be is no longer an option. So with that, let me uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, I can take some questions from the audience. You're muted, unmute yourself. Years of practice and I still can't get it right. <laughs> so uh, we do have some questions from the audience, but I'm good. going I'm to sure start with do. a statement saying um, that one of our attendees says she has a whole new appreciation for invasive plants, especially in urban environments. So thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so one question is, can you compare nine feet of horse manure to 11 pounds of nitrogen falling on cities? <laughs> That's a great, that is a great question. <laughs> that is really a turn. Well, you know, the thing about horse manure that is really important is that it's highly flammable. So in, in these cities in the 1880s and 90s, there was so much horse, you didn't want to live near a stable. And, you know, particularly a wooden stable, because the chances of that catching on fire and burning down and all the adjacent houses was very high. So that's why a lot of the, the stables are built out of brick, you know, the late, a later stage, because with the fire hazard associated with all that horse manure uh, was what was really uh, worrying people because it is highly flammable. Oh, I didn't realize that, huh? Um, let's see, are these changes also observed in suburbia and how do you recon reconcile novel environment to the plant specific insects survival and birds disappearance? Well, that would be a reference to the work of Doug Tallamy. And, you know, I've uh, debated him on more than one occasion. Um, the thing about what I, my response to that is that, you know, you can do whatever you want in your own yard. I mean, that's the thing about gardening is you get to play God. You decide who lives and who dies. This is a weed. I don't want it. I want this. And, you know, and so that is really, that's the essence of gardening. And that's why people do it is it's, it gives great satisfaction and you can do it for aesthetic reasons you can do it for ecological reasons but you can't necessarily scale it up that's what I meant about this word scale in other words, to the landscape scale you can't just treat the, 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 the wider world like a garden you know there aren't enough gardeners and it's not it's an ecological process and so 
Yes, we need to take care of birds. We need to take care of pollinators. Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. And oak trees are great. I think oak trees should be planted, but oak trees are not the best urban tree, you know? And in, a, in an urban context, you know, one of the things that trees do is they make it more livable for everybody, you know, and, and they're beautiful. And, uh, but, you know, they can also tear up infrastructure. They can take down wires, they lift sidewalks. So in an urban context, you've got to think about more than just, you know, pollinators or birds. You have to think about the whole big picture. Now, once you get out into the countryside, then you, it's easier to think about it. But, you know, this idea that, you know, we should only plant native species for the sake of pollinators, uh, you know, and birds, it's really, I hate to say it, but it's really simplistic. And it implies that we as people are in control of the ecology. And I think one thing that, you know, we've learned from what's happening with climate change is we're not in control of this process. And there are lots of, you know, we need to think about all of the issues involved when we plant trees, you know, cause they're gonna live a long time. And so, you know, planting oak trees, it may be an appropriate response in certain circumstances, but there are lots of cases when, you know, it, it's not the right response. And I've spent 30 years of my life studying the ginkgo tree, which is a remarkably adaptable urban tree. It's not on anybody's invasive species list. It's not native but it's a great tough tree that you can plant it and it will survive urban conditions. And we actually need species like that. You know, a lot of our native trees uh, don't do that well uh, in urban conditions. So we really need to think about the big picture here. Hmm. Um, could you comment on the invasive jumping worm and what it might mean for the future? <laughs> oh now I'm going God. to have nightmares. <laughs> You know, I remember going to my first lecture about invasive earthworms in New England. It must have been 20 years ago. And, you know, I was shocked that this was like such a big issue. And so I said, well, okay, let's assume they're disrupting the native ecosystem. What do you, what do, you do about it? How do you actually get rid of, well, we can remove all the topsoil that has the worms in it. Okay, you can do that in your own garden, but you can't, that's not a landscape approach. And the other thing you can do, it turns out, is that you take um, hot pepper extract. You can buy evidently, uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, you know, Tabasco sauce, five gallon drums of Tabasco sauce, and dilute it down and you can saturate the soil with Tabasco sauce. That's another thing you can do about invasive earthworms. But the fact of the matter is, is what, what, what do you do about these things? It's a very complicated thing. And it's like the herbicides with the plants, you know, is the treatment gonna be worse than the problem? And I think you really have to, look hard at that question. And, and that's what's happened with, with you know, the use of uh, herbicides. A lot of people, when they, you know, weigh the pros and cons of invasives versus use of herbicides, it's not an open or shut case. You know, the, the environmentalists want to use the herbicides, but a lot of the general public is really opposed to it. So these are complicated issues. Hmm. Um, can you also talk about uh, in a rain garden, what type of plants are needed to remove pollution in the rainwater? Well, any, you know, passing water that passes through any vegetative landscapes, and they know this based on a lot of agricultural landscapes where there's a lot of runoff from fertilizer use. If you create a buffer zone that's, you know, 10 meters wide or, you know, whatever, even if it's only five meters wide, as the runoff passes through that vegetated area, a lot of those pollutants are taken out of circulation before it enters into a, a lake or a stream. So anything you can do, so as opposed to just creating what I would call a detention basin where the water collects, that it, it has to pass through a vegetated area. So that's where a place like the New Jersey Meadowlands, all that water, the phragmitis is filtering that water. So you have to give the plants the opportunity to extract. And what they're good at is taking out phosphorus and nitrogen. And some of them can actually take out heavy metals as well. But they're, the phosphorus and the nitrogen, they turn that into organic matter. So, you know, that's, that's really good. The heavy metals, they, they stay in the organic matter. So unless you remove the organic matter, but they're taking them out of circulation. So, you know, for a rain garden, my favorite plant is the uh, bald cypress, uh, the Taxodium disticum from down south. And that, 
you know, that does incredibly well. That's one of these plants that, you know, was sort of marginal 20 or 30 years ago, but now it does, uh, you know, in Cornwall, Connecticut, where you have a place in the Berkshires, I planted one 20 years ago and it's a beautiful, it's, you know, survived really low temperatures. It's a great tree. And even if it's dry, it does well. And, um, you know, you need species that are really gonna, you know, be there for the long haul. So the more vegetation, the better. That's if you wanna clean up the water. Great. Well, I, I just noticed that we're at, at 2.15. So I am yeah, going was, to- I went on too long, I'm sorry. That's okay. I don't think anybody minded. I'm just gonna talk on behalf of everybody in the audience there. And if anyone watching wants to fight me on that, you can. But <laughs> I thank you for your time today, Peter. And this has been seriously eye-opening. And I think that we all have a lot to talk about now. Um, so thank all you right. so much. And for those of you watching from home, keep watching um, the Westport Library uh, website for future events with and without the uh, Westport Garden Club and thank you to all the Westport. Yeah, I want to thank Topsy in particular for organizing this. So thank you, Topsy, for uh, inviting uh, me. If, and if, can, I, can I say something? Sure. sure I Topsy, think... if you'd like to turn your um, video back on, you can come back onto the screen. Peter. Yes. Thank you. You were, to me, uh, there's so much new information and the way you presented it was spectacular. And uh, I think at the risk of being brash, you might be my favorite speaker that we've had at the Garden Club. <laughs> oh, well, thank, thank you, you very much. That's very a very high much. compliment, a very high compliment. Thank Great. you very much and, and uh, enjoy the rest. Make sure and go outside and enjoy these warm temperatures. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay. And thank you to the Westport Garden Club and have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.